Good afternoon. Let us continue our discussion on classical literature by examining classical epic poetry and discussing Homer's Iliad and Odyssey as contextual texts. So the epic was an important art form in classical literature. By classical literature, we mean the literature of the Greeks and the Romans. By classical literature, we refer to the literature of the Greeks and the Romans. And remember that whenever you study Renaissance epic, they will refer you to classical epic because the English writers who wrote the epic in the 16th century modeled themselves after Homer and Virgil, who were classical epic writers. Because you see, the English Renaissance was informed by the classical humanism. So we'll begin by defining the epic. The epic is a long narrative poem. The epic is a long narrative poem that is written in an elevated style and used to praise heroic deeds. The epic is a long narrative poem written in an elevated style and used to praise heroic deeds. So among the characteristics of the epic that you need to understand, among the characteristics of the epic that you need to understand are that it is long. The epic is a, it's a long poem, the lengthiest poem. Though no more being written, it is not being written anymore. It is the long, is the is a very long poem. This, which is why it is organized in books. You cannot read it in one day. It's narrative because it tells a story, and it tells the stories of heroic deeds actions of heroes in the traditional sense that we talked about in the morning people who were brave soldiers knights people who did great things so the epic is within an elevated style which is the grand style the style of the epic is the grand style the style of the epic is the grand style the language has dignity and solemnity. The language has dignity and solemnity of tone. The epic praise the rake deeds, tells of actions of great people. The epic narrates heroic deeds, talking of actions of great people. The epic did not use ordinary language, but an elevated language, language suitable for talking about kings and queens and their actions. So the epic was used to immortalize heroes. The epic was used to immortalize heroes. Most of them who died while fighting for the cause of their communities, while defending the land. 
are protecting the people. And so there had to be stories for my life in poetry to remember them. So that they will not be forgotten. Some kings had the penchant of taking poets to the battlefields so that they could witness the heroism in display. And after the war, these poets will write down what they witnessed at the, at the battlefield in the form of poetry. So the, the, the kings were conscious of their immortality. That, mean, that means continuing to live after they died. And how do you achieve immortality? By living in the hearts and the memories of the people. And how do you live in the hearts and the memories of the people? You have to do something outstanding. Mostly in a positive sense. Because some people do something outstanding in a negative sense. Okay? So that their stories will continue to be told from generation to generation. And one of the ways that an individual could be mortalized is in good poetry, good art works, good literature. Sometimes when someone does something good, we say, let us paint the person. Let us draw the person. Let us build a sculpture of the person in the heart of the city. Because these are our heroes. Because that painting is a work of art to immortalize the hero. And of course, an individual could be painted in poetry. Because poetry is also an art. But which one which uses words to immortalize events and individuals. That's what you need to understand. So the epic was that kind of story, was that, what kind of, that kind of art form was valuable to that extent. But the epic at this time was not necessarily written down, it was composed and stored in the brain, memorized, it was composed and memorized orally, and then recited at events. So you could imagine how intelligent those bards were. By bards, we mean writers of epic. B-A-R-D-S, bards. You can imagine how intelligent they were to compose the epic, memorize it, and then recite at important events when needed. So, but the thing about oral literature is that there are bound to be variations over time because some people can add and subtract from the story until it is written down or codified. They usually begins with an invo invocation of the muse because the epic is an inspired art so it usually begins with an invocation of the muse all right so the epic is an inspired art the epic is an inspired art it was believed that the individual needed to be inspired in order to be able to write the epic. And that explained why you had the invocation of the muse at the start of the epic. 
by invocation of the muse we mean the poet calling on the god of poetry m-u-s-e to take over the writing process because with his own powers he cannot do nothing okay just as the pastor says that the holy spirit should take over the sermon the preaching so it will not be his word but it will be the spirit speaking through him so the bard will ask the muse to inhabit him the bard will ask the muse to inhabit him <laughs> so that he will write a great poem the plus structure of the epic is in media's race the plus structure of the epic is in media's race the plus structure of the epic is in media's race by that we mean in the middle of things in the middle of things in media's race is spelled spelled i n space m e d i a s then space r e s in media's race in the middle of things the epic begins in the middle of the events then works his way back to the beginning and then goes to the end the epic is usually organized in books and cantos. The epic is usually organized in books and cantos. The epic is usually organized in books and cantos. A number of cantos make up a book of epic. And you could have up to 12 books. That's how lengthy the epic was. It was organizing books and cantos cantos is spelled c a n t o s please and you could have up to 12 books of a single epic so the surviving epic from the classical period is the Iliad by Homer and the An Odyssey by the same author. So the Iliad is also called Song of Ilium. Song of William, Song of William, I L I U M. The two epics are related in the sense that one continues where the other stops. Odyssey and Iliad are related in the sense that one continues where the other stops. The Odyssey continues where the Iliad stops. So the Odyssey is sequel to the Iliad. Odyssey is sequel to the Iliad. Odyssey is sequel to the Iliad. S E Q U E L sequel to the Iliad, meaning that it is a two-part story. The Iliad begins the story, and the Odyssey completes the story. Whereas the Iliad is prequel to Odyssey, the Iliad is prequel to the Odyssey. P R E Q U E L prequel.
So the Lear tells an ancient story about the Trojan War. The Lear talks about the Trojan War, capital letter T R O J A N, the Trojan War. The Lear tells the story of the Trojan War. The war was fought over a woman by name Helen. The war was fought over a woman by name Helen. You must have heard of Helen of Troy. And the war lasted for 10 years. During which time the Greek city state laid siege to the city of Troy, demanding the release of Helen, which Paris had eloped with. The Greek city state laid siege to the city of Troy for 10 years demanding the handing over a villain which Paris had eloped with, run away with from their love, lawful husband. During a diplomatic mission in Sparta, One of the major characteristics of the epic is the intervention of the gods, intervention of the supernatural. One of the major characteristics of the epic is the intervention of the supernatural. The intervention of the supernatural. The gods get, getting involved in human affairs. In the epic we have the gods intervening in human affairs, taking sides, supporting uh, the warriors, and changing or influencing the course of events. So that's one of the characteristics of the epic, the intervention by the supernatural human affairs. So, the Iliad is an ancient Greek epic poem The Iliad is an ancient Greek, uh, Greek epic poem that is written in dactylic hexameter written in dactylic hexameter it is made up of 15,903 it is made of 15,693 lines it is made up of 15,693 lines. That shows you how lengthy the poem is. That shows you how lengthy the poem is. The poem begins in media's ways. The poem begins in media's ways. The poem begins in media's ways. After the invocation of the muse.
when the poem begins, we are trying to grapple with the story now. When the poem begins, the Trojan War is being waged against the city of Troy by the Greeks, known as the Achaeans. By the Greeks, known as the Achaeans. A C H A E N S. The war is caused by the elopement of Paris with Helen from her from her husband Menelaus, king of Sparta. The war is caused by the elopement of Paris with Helen. Paris went to Sparta for a diplomatic mission and fell in love with Helen, thought to be the most beautiful woman in the world at the time. She was thought to be the most was thought to be the most beautiful woman in the world at the time. When Paris, a, one of the uh, a prince of Troy, meets her in Sparta, he falls in love with her, seduces her, and takes her and runs away with her back to Troy. The husband of Helen is Menelaus. M-E-N-E-L-A-U-S. M-E-N-E-L-A-U-S. He is the king of Sparta. Of course, the Spartans were known for their warlike nature, for their prowess in war. They were, they were taught never to turn their back on their enemies. And of course, in one particularly difficult battle, they faced their enemies and they died in their number. And so a stone was raised in the honor which read, Go tell Sparta, ye who passes by. That he obedient to our laws will I. Go, tell Sparta, ye who passes by, that he obedient to our laws will I. So, Menelaus, because you see, the princes of Greek city states were all interested in marrying Helen of Troy. Helen. Isn't she was not from. Troy, but I don't know why she's called Helen of Troy. So they made a pact that Helen could choose whoever she wanted to marry of all of them, and that when the choice has been made, that all of them will unite together to protect her and make sure that no one takes her away from the husband. But she was so beautiful that no man could resist her beauty. That's why all of them were interested in marrying her. And so, of course, then you can also blame Paris for falling into the temptation and the trap. So it could be said that it was a woman that brought down Troy, because at the end of the war, Troy was bent down. Sustaining the motif of the theme fatale in history. The woman brought down Troy. And so, after Paris, one of the princes of Troy looked with Helen. Menelaus organized the Greek army. And they traveled with their best men in many, in many ships to fight Troy and to take back Helen. And the war lasted for 10 years. So as the epic story opens, crisis 
crisis. Crisis is spelled C H R Y S E S. C H R Y C H R Y S E S. Crisis. A Trojan priest of Apollo. A Trojan priest of Apollo. A P O W L O. Offers the Greek wealth for the return of his daughter. Crisis. Offers the Greeks wealth. Offers the Greeks wealth for the return of his daughter. Crisis. The daughter crisis is spelled C H R Y S E I S. The father is C H R Y S E S. The daughter is C H R Y S E I S. Crisis and crisis. So Agamemnon refuses the offer, even though the others opted for opt for it. Agamemnon is spelled A G A M E M N O N. Agamemnon. He was the leader of the Greek army. He was the leader of the Greek army. Agamemnon, A G A M E M N O N refuses the offer made by Christ says even though the others opt for it when this offer is refused when this offer is refused Christ says prays to Apollo to cause a plague among the Greek army Christ says prays to Apollo to cause a plague among the Greek army this plague lasts for nine days. This plague, this plague lasts for nine days. And during these nine days, Agamemnon is under pressure to return crisis to her father. During the nine days of the plague, Agamemnon is under pressure to return crisis to the father. At the end, or in the end, Agamemnon agrees. In the end, Agamemnon agrees, but decides to take Achilles' capture, braces. Agamemnon agrees, but decides to take Achilles' capture. The person that Achilles captured by name Braces. Braces is spelled B R E I S E I S. B R E I S E I S. Braces. So, this action of taking Braces captured by Achilles. Angers the warrior Achilles. It angers the warrior Ach Achilles. Achilles was the Achilles was the legendary Greek warrior, invincible, and could not be killed by human weapon. No human weapon could harm Achilles. You must have heard of him. This was because when he was born, his mother was instructed to bath, to bathe him in a, a mythic river, the river Styx. For fortification. So that no, no human weapon would destroy him but the mistake the mother made was that not all the parts of the body was dipped in the water because she held him by the ankle one of the legs the ankle 
So that point where the mother held him did not touch the water. And that was the only weak spot that Achilles had. And so if anybody needed to kill Achilles, you only needed to know the weak spot and to direct the arrow there. And that's why today when people speak, people say, ground not is my Achilles heels. Achilles heels. That means ground not is my weakness. You can trap me with ground not. Okay? So, and that is exactly how Achilles would die in the war because after he has killed Hector, when Paris is told, when a revelation is made and Paris, Paris knows his weak spots, he simply directs his arrow there and that was how he died. So, that is the concept, that's where we get the concept of the Achilles heels. The weak spot of the individual could be wine, could be women, could be money, could be fame. Okay? So that's Achilles. So Achilles is angry that the lady he captured. Has been, has been taken by the leader of the Greek army, Agamemnon. And he refuses to fight again. So Achilles declares that his men will no longer fight in the war. He withdraws his army from the war. His men were called the Mabidons. The, Mab the Mabidons. M Y R M I D O N S, the Mabidons. So Christ says, is returned to her father by Odysseus. Christ says, is returned to the father by Odysseus. Odysseus is spelled O D Y, double S E U S. Christ says, is returned to the father by Odysseus. This is spelled O D Y double S E U S. Remember that when we get to when we get to when we get to the second part of the story, that is Odyssey, the focus will be on Odysseus. But here it's not uh, it's just one of the important characters. But in Odyssey, the story will be focused on him. So note that it is Odysseus who returns crisis to the father, crisis. And this brings an end to the plague that was caused by Apollo on the order of, on the prayers of crisis, crisis. Achilles is hurt and he prays to his mother by name Thetis. T H E T I S. Prays to his mother by name Thetis. T H E T I S. And what is the prayer about? The prayer is that the mother should have to bring the Greek to a breaking point so that they will know how important he is to them. Achilles prays to his mother to make the Achilles be under such pressure that realize how important he is to them in the war. So what Thetis does is to make a request to Zeus. Z-E-U-S. Thetis makes a request to Zeus. Z E U S. Z E U S. To grant Achilles request. To grant Achilles request. 
to grant a Kelly's request. This causes Agamemnon to dream of attacking the Trojans. We are talking about the intervention of the gods now. This causes Agamemnon, the leader of the Greek army, to dream of attacking the Trojans. Agamemnon, I'm sorry, Agamemnon decides to test the will of the Greek army. Agamemnon decides to test the will of the Greek army. By by asking the soldiers if they would like to go home. By asking the soldiers if they would like to go home. Of course, most of the soldiers said they would like to go home. The situation is only saved by Odysseus, who is inspired by the goddess Athena to make a speech to motivate the soldiers to stay. Odysseus makes a speech that inspires the soldiers to stay. All right. So it is Odysseus who inspires the soldiers to stay by making a motivating speech. But the speech is inspired by a goddess by name Athena, spelled A T H E N A. So both the Trojans and the Greeks are preparing for war. Both the Trojans and the Greeks are preparing for war. But before the war takes place, but before the war takes place, Paris makes a proposal with Menelaus. the king of Sparta, the husband of Helen of Troy. Whoever wins the duel will win the war to save the life of the men. Whoever wins the duel will win the war to save the life of the men. So there is a temporary truce to create an enabling environment for the duel to take place. There is a temporary truce to make the duel to take place in a conducive environment. During the fight, Paris is defeated but is not killed. In the fight, Paris is defeated, but he is not killed. A goddess by name Aphrodite intervenes and rescues him. A goddess by name Aphrodite, spelled A P H R O D I T E. Aphrodite intervenes and rescues Paris. The truce is broken by Pandora's. The truce, a brief period of peace, is broken by Pandora's. Pandora's is spelled P A N D O R A S. The truce is broken by Pandarus. Pandarus is a Trojan soldier who wounds Menelaus. 
with an arrow. Thanatos is a Trojan soldier. He wounds Menelaus, the, the Spartan king, with an arrow. It is seen that this action is caused by the intervention of the of the god Hera. The goddess Hera is the the goddess Hera is the cause of this problem. Hera is spelled H E R. Hera is under pressure. Hera is the goddess of womanhood. And she hates the Trojans. And so that's why she causes the problems. So sometimes when you have the itch to cause problem, cause problems, may not be you doing, maybe some spirits like Hera. Remember, there is peace. You say, Why is there peace in this place? Let me cause problems. It's not you. Okay? So the battles, the battle begins again. The battle resumes. In this battle, the gods are seen intervening and helping their sides to win. That's the sides that they favor to win. So that is important because that marks the intervention of the supernatural in the world of the epic. The battle stops and resumes. The dead are burnt. It's called cremation. It's called what? Cremation. The dead are burnt. The Greeks burnt the dead. They don't bury. Okay, they say, okay, maybe let us just stop the war for some time. Let us be able to burn our dead. So there is pressure mounting on both sides. Paris is asked to return Helen to end the war. Once in a while, the Trojan Council will meet and you say, Paris, why don't you just return this girl? Return this girl. There are so many beautiful ladies in Troy. Okay? But you see, the evil spirit in Paris will say, don't return. Because the evil spirit wants the city to come down. All right? All the evil spirit, they want the city to be burnt down. So they say, don't return. It's a matter of pride. Okay, you should not return. So the pressure is on both sides. The Council of Troy will meet Paris return Helen. Okay? But it's like if you return, then your pride is hurt as a man. Okay? It means, it means that you are not strong enough, you are not brave enough, you have, and you have been defeated. Okay? What a shameful act. <laughs> So Paris is asked to return Helen to end the war by refuses and instead offers wealth. Agamemnon is forced to ask for Achilles' help at a point because Achilles had withdrawn because Agamemnon took Briseis, the beautiful lady he captured for himself. So at the point Agamemnon has, has no no option than to return Bryces so that um, Achilles will come back to fight. Because they know that without Achilles, Achilles, they could lose the war. And of course, Achilles already prayed to the manner to make them, the Greeks, know how important he is to them. So Agamemnon returns Bryces to Achilles with a plea for him to return to the battlefield. Achilles is felt. Achilles is spelled A C H I double L E S. Achilles. So Achilles accepts, but will only return to the war front when the Greeks are in, in a desperate situation. 
and see how proud he was. Okay? I will only return when you guys are about to die. And I will come as a savior to save you guys. You know? <clears throat> so you know how important I am. I am Achilles. Specifically, when the Trojans begin burning the Greek ships. Because the ship is your ticket back home. So if the ships are burned, then you are ruined. You're going to die in Troy. So that's indeed a desperate situation. Achilles is only moved when Patroclus is murdered by Hector. Patroclus is spelled P-A-T-R-O-C-L-U-S. Patroclus, a very close friend of Achilles, is murdered by Hector. Hector is um, the first son of Priam, P-R-I-A-M, Priam, the king of Troy. Achilles is only moved when Patroclus is murdered by Hector. He vows to avenge Patroclus' death. But this also means that Achilles will not live long after killing Hector. Remember that in the classical period, or in the world of the Greeks and the Romans, human destiny was known right from birth. Right? Human destiny was known right from birth. And the individual life was fated. Was what? Fated. And that's why one of the themes raised in all epics is fate. You know, fate. The events in the epic are fated. That means they have been foretold long before they happen. But even then, humanity cannot still avoid the, the, the events from coming to pass. So, even when Achilles was, by the time Achilles was born, he was told, kill Hector and die. I mean, the time, by the time you kill Hector, know that you are dead. Okay? So, but you know all these things, but you cannot avoid it. Because situations will happen that, you, that will not make you not to avoid your destiny or your fate. So, a fated event is the, is the one that cannot be averted. A fated event is one that cannot be averted. A V E R T E D. That cannot be averted. So Achilles knows that when he kills Hector, he is going to die. His, his, his death is near. The Trojans flee before the Greeks when Achilles returns to the battlefield. The Trojans are saved by Apollo. The Trojans are saved by Apollo, Apollo, who distracts Achilles. Hector decides to face Achilles despite all the warnings from everyone, including his parents. His father was Priam, P-R-I-A-M. His mother was Hecuba, H-E-C-U-B-A, Hecuba. Spend one because the prophecy is already there. Fight with Hector and you will die. And um, sorry, fight with Achilles and you will die. Or Achilles, kill Hector and then you will die. So Hector is killed by Achilles. His death implies that Achilles must die in the war. In anger, Achilles dishonors, dishonors Hector, Hector's body by dragging it around. Priam has to go and beg for his son's body from Achilles in order to afford a burial. Now, this is exactly what happens um, in the epic. But we have a story of how the war ended. We are told that the, the, the siege on Troy lasted for 10 years. So this poem is written in the last year of the war, towards the end of the war. Okay? And the, 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 the walls of Troy are so heavily 
defend it and fortify that no human beings could break into. So the, the Greeks had to de devise a trick to get and to gain entry, uh, entry into the city through what has come to be known as the Trojan Horse. The Trojan Horse. So they deceived the Trojans that the horse that they built, <coughs> sorry, the horse that they built and placed in front of the gate of the city is a gift from the gods. Without knowing that there were soldiers in the belly of that horse. Okay? Trojan soldiers. Greek soldiers. And so, the Trojans, in their ignorance, um, took the horse into the city with feasting and music and songs and dance and merriment. And at night, when everybody had slept, drunk, relaxed, the Trojan so uh, the Greek soldiers came out and sacked the city. And that's how um, Helen was released. And that was how Achilles was killed because in the fighting. Paris killed Achilles. Helen returns. Helen is returned to the husband. And that's how the story ends. So we'll have to end the class there for today.